According to his promise, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. <clears throat> Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, spotless and blameless, and grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our growth comes through the scriptures. Join me once again in Philemon. This is our new Philemon series, lesson three or four, or something like that, real early in the series. Calling it a Philemon series. I guess that's appropriate. It's going to be a short series, though. It's a single chapter book. It's got 25 verses. I think there's 335 Greek words from uh, beginning to end. And, uh, and we only have 19 weeks to finish it because uh, we want to wrap it up by the end of the year. And uh, remember, everything else gets put on hold for 2022 when, uh, when we start our Through the Bible year. So anyway, Lord willing, rapture pending, that's uh, kind of what we have in store for this series. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved brother and fellow worker, and to Apphia, our sister, and to Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, before we get started tonight, let's take a moment for silent prayer, humbling ourselves under the authority of the Word of God. Shall we pray? Most gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you tonight thankful for grace and truth, rejoicing in the privilege and blessing that it is to assemble together, thankful for this, this oasis that uh, Austin Bible Church represents. In the middle of a, of a crazy week, we have a, uh, a day of rest, Father, where we get to assemble together and humble ourselves under the authority of the Word of God. I thank you for the, the, uh, the, the testimony that you provided and the blessings that you've provided with having a gifted pastor teacher and a positive local church, brothers and sisters that are hungry to be fed. So, Father, uh, bless that hunger tonight and, uh, and feed us abundantly. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. All right, well, before we do get to the Philemon portion, the microphone is ready to go, so uh, we can take some questions tonight, Q&A night. And uh, I believe Dean mentioned he had a question. You told me at prayer meeting you had a question. All right. Was it the one about loved ones in heaven? Okay. You want to ask? Yeah, you should ask it first on the microphone, and then I can answer with loved ones in heaven, what is their ability? Do they have any ability to know or see what's going on down here on earth? You know, everybody asks that. It's a great question. It's a natural question. The Bible doesn't exactly say, um, because we only have a couple of glimpses of, of heaven anyway. Um, in one case, halfway through the tribulation, there's martyrs in heaven and they're, they're lamenting how long before God's vengeance is going to strike. And, and, uh, and he tells them to quit worrying about it. And he says, just rest until the number of, of your brethren is, is made complete. And, and he, he, put, he puts a robe on them and they go back to sleep under the altar. And to me, that, that says a lot. That says that the folks that are all hot and bothered about the life they left behind need to you know, chill. I mean, you're in heaven. Come on, you're with the Lord. So, um, and that's that's on that example. On the Lazarus and the rich man story, um, it's the it's the again, it's the unbeliever. The rich man is the one that has all the regrets. He wants somebody to go and warn his brothers so that they don't end up where he is and all that. Lazarus never says a word that entire chapter. He's just in the bosom, Abraham's bosom, and being comforted and and doesn't have a thing to say. So, my theory, I mean, my conclusion, my conviction, uh, whatever you want to call it, um, forgetting what lies behind. I mean, on an ultimate basis, why, why would, like my mother, or my father, anybody that's in heaven today, we kind of get this emotional thing, sentimental thing, you know, it'd be nice to think that mom's looking down on me and whatever. Uh, but I don't, honestly don't think she is, you know, why would she? And, and, She's face to face with Jesus Christ, and she is in the presence of His glory, and and just, you know, she's run her race. She's laid aside that that. Uh, so, my conviction is that they don't pay attention, and we're going to be there soon enough anyway. You know, we're not that far behind, and and you know, so by the time we arrive, you know, for for them, how much time has passed in 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 that interval? You know, so anyway, that's that's kind of a long answer to a short question, but I'm skeptical. 
uh, that anyone would, would want to even look down here and see what's going on. So, all right. Other questions? All right, back row over there. Robert's got a question. Well, you and I have uh, talked occasionally about whether the people who've gone before us are in, in heaven or even conscious of how much time has gone by. Oh. Right. I mean, Paul's been, the Apostle Paul's been there for 2,000 years. You know, that first generation, you know, they, are, they, are they bored yet? You know, are they just, are we taking too long to get there? You know, it's, it's hard for us to relate because we are still in our mortality. We're still in our finite, mortal, temporal existence. And, and even with doctrine, even with divine viewpoint, even with eyes to see and ears to hear, we still, I think, have a fundamental finite existence that's moving through a time stream one day at a time. And the idea of operating timelessly, the idea of, of stepping outside of space and time and, and functioning in a, in a timeless manner, it's hard to kind of comprehend what that's even like. So, I don't know. We'll find out when we get there. So, all right. Across the aisle over here. I kind of figured we were overdue for a long night of Q&A. It's been a while since we've had more than one or two questions. Uh, in Ephesians 4, uh, verse, verse 11, uh -huh. uh, where it mentions apostles, prophets, he, he himself gave some to be apostles and some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Uh, and of course, it says there for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. That's has to do with something that's happening now, I believe, isn't it? Uh, whereas the the apostles and prophets of Ephesians two twenty, uh, those are different because those were the apostles that were used to close the canon. Correct. Yes. And so, um, yes, yeah, that, that's a good question. So, it's the same apostles and prophets in chapter two and in chapter four. Um, but it's just with the recognition that there's four gifts that are mentioned here. There's only four some as is. Some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists. And then the fourth some as is both pastors and teachers. Okay? And it's not a fifth some as that separates the pastors from the teachers. That's a combined hyphenated gift there. But um, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of service. So, um, and, and it's unique. Of all the giftedness passages, you can look at Romans 12, you can look at 1 Corinthians 12, you can look at... First Peter 4, you can look at, there's an assortment of spiritual gift passages where it's very clear that the Holy Spirit gives the spiritual gift. But this is a context where it's Jesus Christ is the subject of the verb. Yes, he's the one that descended. He's the one that ascended. He's the one that's now giving gifts to men. And um, but what he's doing, So, and the way I reconcile this, the Holy Spirit gives the gift, but Jesus Christ gives the gifted believer to the various lampstands where he assigns them because he's the head of the church. And so he moves believers to different lampstands. So he gives some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, some as pastors and teachers. And so if it makes, by way of illustration, then uh, the Holy Spirit gave me my spiritual gift uh, when I got saved in September of 1973 is when I received the gift of pastor teacher. I didn't know it yet, but I was just a kid. But, you know, that's, I got my gift at the moment of my salvation. But then in November of 1995 is when Jesus Christ gave me as a gifted pastor teacher to the flock of, of Austin Bible Church. So that's why you have Jesus Christ here in Ephesians 4 as the subject of the verb he gave. And so that's the, the, uh, the opportunity there. Now all the gifts are edifying gifts, but these four are specifically equipping gifts. And it's a different verb than, than a verb for edification or building up. And so the equipping gifts include apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. Those are the equipping gifts, almost like uh, drill sergeants or in a, in, a, in a boot camp kind of capacity related to equipping uh, soldiers for, the, for that work of service. So it's a great text. I'm looking forward to it. And uh, like I say, that Ephesians is our next book study after Philemon. So I uh, look forward to starting Ephesians after the Through the Bible year. And uh, Lord willing and rapture pending, if any of us are still here in, in 2023, uh, the plan is, is to, uh, to start tackling Ephesians at that point in time. Did I answer your question? Okay. Sometimes I ramble and I forget what the original question was. <laughs> okay, well, good. All right, other questions? Dean, did you have another one? Okay. 
you stated it earlier, but when Poimen or Pomenus died to Daskalos, uh -huh. uh, when they're combined, it's it's like if the and is not there. Right. So what you have here, beyond the fact that they're connected with a chi, um, it's really the the some as some as some as, and so you've got a men, the tus men, apostolus, and then tus de. So it's like a men de construction, only it's men de de de, and then you got uh, here's another tus de as evangelist, and here's the fourth tus de. So you start with a tus men, and then you have tus de tus de tus de, and in the English it's some as, some as, some as, some as. Okay? And there's only four some as's. Because the fourth some as is the fourth tus de, poimenas chi didascalus. And right there, you got both of those nouns that are both connected with the chi, and they're both linked to that fourth tus de. And so, um, grammarians uh, uh, will call this the Granville Sharp construction. There's been tons of writing on it and different things connected to that. And in fact, furious arguments as to uh, whether this qualifies even as a Granville Sharp, and some deny it and some that insist upon it, and they, they fight it out and whatever else. But uh, regardless of, of that specific argument, I'm looking at two, at the, the Mende construction, and there's only four. So you don't have a fifth one in there that separates the pastors from the teachers. Right. On the one hand this, on the other hand that. In this case, Paul just had four hands. <laughs> yeah. Good question, though. I appreciate that. Would you explain the... Uh, there are those that may call the pastor-teacher gift an office. Would okay. You, would you explain yeah, yeah. why you hold to the view you hold to? Okay, so like I say, there's, there's, um, and this is in the basic doctrinal studies notebook, uh, category 10, which is charismatology. Um, so there are gifts, there are also ministries, and there are also effects. And offices are not gifts. Offices are actually ministries. And so um, there's a difference between gifts and offices. And, and you can aspire to an office. You can be qualified for an office. You can be disqualified for an office. But a gift is a grace thing that you were given at the moment of your salvation, and you can never lose it. The gift is lifelong, and, and you never lose the gift in the, in the New Testament. So, um, so uh, Romans 12, uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 12, uh, 1 Peter 4, these are kind of the main spiritual gift passages that we have, which, by the way, don't include poimen kai didaskalos in, in most of those other passages. This is the text where we find poimen kai didaskalos, very highlighted and spotlighted in this way. So um, I think based upon that, it does open itself up for those kind of discussions. Is it a gift? Is it an office? Well, when we see uh, apostle, when we see evangelist, you know, when we see prophets, those are obviously spiritual gifts because they're included in the Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12 passages. And I think a lot of times they're just abbreviated as teachers. Some people just say, okay, they're all the same, pastor, teachers, and teachers. But I think there's a difference. I think there's teachers that are not pastors, and then, of course, there's the pastors. Every pastor is a teacher. So that's how I view it anyway. And that ends up with a total of 20 uh, church-age gifts. Uh, 11 are permanent. Nine are on the temporary side of things. So anyway, I would encourage... Uh, I love those questions. They're all excellent questions. Um, the office of overseer in 1 Timothy 3. It is a fine work that he desires to do. The office of overseer. Not every elder is, is an overseer. And so there's a difference between um, pastor, overseer, and elder. All three of those terminologies. One's a gift, one's an office, and one's a maturity status. And everybody should grow to elder. Everybody should grow to a spiritual maturity, uh, regardless of their gift or no matter what office they might serve in or might not serve in. So, um, yeah, I think that's a, a worthwhile study, too, the difference between a gift, a ministry, and a maturity status. That uh, is also helpful. All right. Anything else tonight? I can give a last call in the Q&A. All right, let's get the microphone over to Adam. Is this your question or is this a YouTube question? Uh, no, th there's no questions and there's no questions on the chat. Uh, I just wasn't seeing the laptop on the uh, streaming. Oh, excellent.
Probably because I forgot to start it. So let me start it. All right, are you seeing it now? Okay. This is the most amazing magic that, uh, I don't know how it works, but it works. All right, I appreciate that. Well, let's go to Philemon and uh, pick up where we left off on, not on Sunday, I, wasn't, I didn't teach on Sunday. It was a week ago tonight, the last time we were together in, uh, in Philemon. In fact, let me, I should have, uh, oh, that's why. All right. I'm going to update my shortcuts here. Let me just start by giving you the outline. We gave it to you a week ago, and doesn't hurt to give it to you a second time. The seventh and final point of introduction, as I was giving uh, an introduction to the study, is the outline. And basically, we're taking these 25 verses and kind of chopping it up into four segments. Uh, like most Pauline epistles, or any epistle really, it opens with a salutation. The uh, senders of a letter are greeting the people that they're greeting. And uh, in this case, the recipients are very personal, which makes it unusual. It's not a typical epistle where Paul's writing to a church, but he's writing to a man and then a woman that we believe is that first man's wife, and then a, a second man that's mentioned who we believe is the pastor of the church. We're going to go through all these details. But essentially, this is the salutation, is the beginning of a letter when the person receiving the letter is being directly addressed. And that's what we have here. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved brother and fellow worker, to Apphia, our sister, to Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, we're going to spend some time on that as well. We're not just going to blow through it and say, here's the standard Paul greeting, but uh, understand what the significance is to a grace and peace benediction. And then the second section takes us from verse 4 down to verse 7 that I've simply titled Thanksgiving and Prayer. Thanksgiving and Prayer, and I might change that label as well because it bugs me when I see things like that. Um, Thanksgiving is a prayer, and then on top of that comes even more prayer, but Anyway, thanksgiving and prayer. He says in verse 4, I thank my God always making mention of you in my prayers. So there you go. And then through verse 5, uh, he says, why is he thanking God? Because he hears of these things. And, but then he goes on to pray for additional things. He says, I pray that the fellowship of your faith may become effective, that the koinonia, the sharing of your faith, may become energetic, uh, effectual, uh, that the Father will be at work in that, to willing to do of His good pleasure, that uh, the fellowship of your faith may become effective through the epinosis of every good thing which is in you for Christ's sake. And this is a marvelous study, and it's worth taking our time to actually explore what exactly is in us for Christ's sake. What did He put in us when He saved us? What are the position possessions that we receive at the moment of salvation? And uh, every good thing that's in you for Christ's sake is a deposit that God put there, and we have all of these blessings from day one, from the moment we get saved. And knowing these things is important, and then sharing these things is important. Uh, one to another is what makes our faith effective. So we're going to deal with that. And then in verse 7, For I have come to have much joy and comfort in your love, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you, brother. And I think this refreshment is important and it's useful for us too in studying various spiritual gifts and various ministries. I think uh, brothers and sisters that are considering maybe if they have an exhortation gift or perhaps another form of ministry that might be one of comforting, uh, might be one of encouragement, might be one of hospitality. There's a variety of Christian ministries inside and beyond local churches whereby refreshment is offered. And if the hearts of the saints have been refreshed, then that's a spiritual function. And uh, Philemon and uh, even uh, you know the others that are mentioned here uh, can be considered as a part of that ministry. And I think it's worth taking the time to, to look at that as well. And so realizing that different believers can have a refreshing ministry beyond uh, the pastor. In fact, in a lot of ways, uh, these, these believers can do things a pastor could never do. 
and go places and talk to people and bear fruit and do things that, that I would never dream of doing because that's not my calling. That's not my giftedness. That's not my ministry uh, pursuit. But uh, for those that are in that calling, um, man, God bless you, and, and we need more. <laughs> so uh, we'll deal with that. So we have the salutation of verses 1 through 3, the thanksgiving and prayer verses 4 through 7, and then the meat of the book itself, the actual meat and potatoes of what this is all about, is the appeal for Onesimus. And this is uh, starting in verse 8, taking us all the way down to verse 20. It's the bulk of the epistle is the appeal for Onesimus. He says in verse 8, Therefore, though I have enough confidence in Christ to order you to do what is proper, yet for love's sake I'd rather appeal to you. And he kind of eases into the main appeal by saying, I'm not going to order you to do anything, but I'm just coming to you as Paul the old man, and I hope you listen to me here. And then he says, I appeal to you for my child Onesimus. And the, the, this book is about Onesimus. Onesimus is returning to his master uh, as a runaway slave, is returning to face the consequences for what he's done. And, uh, and he's, he's putting the scroll in, in Philemon's hand, written by the Apostle Paul. And uh, you can imagine in the ancient world, there were a lot of runaway slaves in the Roman Empire. I can't imagine... You know, this is the only one we know about of a runaway slave that, that returned to his master and he had a, a book of the Bible in his hand, <laughs> handwritten by the Apostle Paul that said, here you go, read this and do what you will. You know, and that's essentially what we have here. It's the appeal for Onesimus. And then we have a conclusion in verses 21 through 25, uh, having confidence in your obedience, obedience, not, not to Paul, he won't be obeying Paul because Paul didn't command him to do anything. But he's going to be obedient to the Word of God. He's going to be obedient to the Lord. He's going to be obedient to the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Having confidence in your obedience, I write to you since I know that you will do even more than what I say. And then uh, the greetings and the various things. Uh, prepare for me a lodging. This is more than just a throwaway verse too, by the way. We're going to pay attention to this. I think this is the, one of the biggest clues that Paul was not in Rome when he wrote this. Because for Paul, when he was in Rome, was intending to go west to, uh, to Spain. And uh, Philemon in, in Colossae would have been the opposite direction. It would have been insane for Paul to say, I'm going to go to, uh, to visit Philemon on my way to Spain. Uh, it would be like leaving Austin and going to Houston by way of El Paso or something. I mean, who does that? Nobody does that. So it's terribly out of the way. It's a big clue there that he was, uh, I think, in Ephesus when he wrote all of the prison epistle. Uh, correspondence. And then the greetings from Epaphras, Mark, uh, Aristarchus, Demas, Luke. That's the same crowd we knew from Colossians chapter 4. Uh, the, the book of Colossians and the book of Philemon are so linked in, uh, in so many different ways. All right, so this is what we're dealing with. Salutation, thanksgiving and prayer, appeal and conclusion. And the, the four segments of this book. Now I'll start the salutation slideshow. And we'll take it from there. Paul, a prisoner. Paul, a prisoner. This is the only book of the New Testament written by Paul, a prisoner. Okay? In most of uh, Paul's writings, he calls himself an apostle, or he calls himself a, a bondservant. Uh, but this is unique in that the only epistle of the New Testament, the only book of the New Testament written by Paul, a prisoner, or anybody a prisoner for that matter. And uh, discuss the... Various Pauline salutations, nine out of the 13, are from Paul, an apostle. It's only First and Second Thessalonians that don't have any kind of appellation on the end of Paul. It's just Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy. doesn't give any kind of description of who Paul is or who Silvanus is or who Timothy is. just lists the three names and takes it from there. Philippians, it's uh, written from Paul and Timothy. Douloi, bondservants, slaves of Christ Jesus. And um, Romans and Titus also combine the slavery vocabulary with the uh, apostle vocabulary that they, that they make use of. The noun desmios is known from other Pauline verses. They're just not salutations. Specifically Ephesians 3, Ephesians 4, 2 Timothy 1, Philemon 9, um, where we are accustomed to prison vocabulary. Speaking about the prisoners, speaking about the chains that bind them, speaking about the, the building they're sitting in. There's uh, several terms that, uh, that deal with that. 
And then we have Timothy the brother. Timothy the brother. So this is, I think, this is where we ended last week. I think we looked at those verses and now we're ready for Timothy the brother. All right, the second co-author of the book is Timothy the brother. And uh, the concept of co-authorship is interesting. We've discussed it a few times. I I don't mind talking about it again. Um, In many of Paul's letters, he has multiple uh, co-authors, Sosthenes, for example, in 1 Corinthians, Timothy in in six of his epistles. When uh, When he lists co-authors, they're listed up front, and then usually they're kind of ignored for the rest of the book. Uh, occasionally they'll, they'll show up again in, in some we statements, some, some plural, first-person plural we statements, uh, but usually they're ignored uh, for the rest of the book after that. And very frequently, even though there's a plurality in the, in the salutation, most of the pronouns are singular in, in the, the text that follows. When Paul will say, I this, and I that, and I something else. And I think that's the case here. Um, he, he says in verse 4, I thank my God always, making mention of you in my prayers. Well, what about Timothy? Is he praying too? Is he thankful too? It just, the, the co-author is listed, but then there's no question that the primary author is in fact Paul, related to any of these epistles. And he's called the brother. The same language that he has in Colossians 1.1, same language that, that is employed of him in 2 Corinthians 1.1. And it's, um, it's not an insult to call him brother in this regard. And when we look at these various terms, fellow worker, fellow soldier, fellow prisoner, um, Paul has an assortment of expressions that he applies to his companions, to his, his teammates, his partners in ministry. And um, some people pour a lot of effort into trying to rank them or trying to build a big argument based upon their usage in, in different ways. Um, and, and it's curious to me, as, as I read those, those theories that they have, um, I think they're missing the biggest point of all, <laughs> is that sometimes less is more. Sometimes simple is, is the highest praise you can imagine. And to call Timothy a brother is extraordinary. Um, there are so many other places, of course, where he's called a child. He's called a son, my true child in the faith, or my son in the faith. When he's writing to Timothy directly in First and Second Timothy, he'll, he'll be very dear and tender towards him, calling him my son. Um, but then to call him a brother is, uh, is extraordinary to me. It's like you know, <clears throat> training under Ralph, and, and Ralph Braun will always be my, my father in the, in the, the pulpit ministry because he's, he's, he's the man that ordained me, he's the man that trained me, he's the man that, um, that officiated at our wedding, and all of our wedding pictures have Ralph in them. You know? and, um, and I wouldn't be a pastor today if it wasn't for, for Ralph Braun. That's, that's clear enough. But the idea that he's my pastoral father, I'm his pastoral son, but then if he was to call me brother, like Paul is calling Timothy here, you know, and which ultimately he does. He did. You know, he laid hands on me, and 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 now we're fellow pastors in 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 ministry and in different things. And so, when when Paul is calling Timothy his brother here, this is uh, just a very noteworthy expression, and I I want to convey that. So um, again, Colossians one one. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, or Timothy, the brother. Uh, in most cases, it's simply a definite article, and uh, the, the personal pronoun is either implied or understood. But Timothy, the brother. Same thing in 2 Corinthians 1.1. 1, 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, the brother, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, with all the saints who are throughout Achaia. All right, and Timothy, we know very well, the name Timotheos means honoring God. Uh, Time is, an, is a, a noun of honor. And of course, theos is the, is the common term for God. And uh, used 24 times in the New Testament, all of which is centered on this guy, the, the only Timothy that we know in the New Testament. Um, Timothy of, of Leicester and Derby, Timothy that joined Paul on the second missionary journey, and uh, co-author of six of Paul's epistles and uh, recipient of two others. Anyway, we know Timothy very well. We did a whole series on Timothy, and uh, the notebook for that is in the hallway as well. Timothy co-authored six of Paul's epistles, and three of which he is called the brother. He is also called a brother in a non-salutation. In 1 Thessalonians 3, 2, 
where he's called a brother. That's not a salutation passage, but it is a reference to Timothy. Where Paul says, Therefore, when we could endure it no longer, we thought it best to be left behind in Athens alone, and we sent Timothy, our brother and God's fellow worker, in the gospel of Christ to strengthen and encourage you as to your faith. This is one of the rare, unusual times where there's a plurality of authors mentioned in, in chapter 1, verse 1, Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy. And then later in the epistle, you have a, a we statement about what Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy have chosen to do. We sent Timothy, our brother and God's fellow worker. So there's a, there's a title for you, okay, in the gospel of Christ to strengthen and encourage you as to your faith. And we're going to discuss this. We're going to discuss what it means to be fellow workers because we're all called to be fellow workers, not just the ones that have the label here. And uh, it's going to be useful for us to realize that when you have, um, uh, when you're a co-worker, when you're, when you're on, a, on a shift, for example, <laughs> we had 20 officers in the sheriff's department uh, at the last uh, duty station that I had there. And, and you, you know, you want to be you know, you got your harder workers and you're not so hard workers. And let's face it, you got your slackers and your, your suck ups and other people that are just there to collect a paycheck. But, you know, the thing is, you want to be the, the best worker that you can because your fellow workers are depending upon you and you don't want to be dragging them down by being a slug. Well, what about with God as your fellow worker? When you're God's co worker, <laughs> okay? And this is the, the most marvelous thing of all is that we're God's co workers and God's doing all the work. He is the one that's working in and through us, both to will and to do of His good pleasure. Uh, it's, our role is to cooperate. Our will, our role is to to be obedient, to humble ourselves, and to to allow Him to do that work. So that'll be a a study coming up as well. The plural brethren is a common New Testament term, but specific brothers referenced by Paul include this handful of references and. And uh, this is uh, exhaustive. This is a list of all the individual men by name that are referred to as brothers. But the plural brethren is a generic expression. And we maybe we don't use it as much here at Austin Bible Church. Um, and maybe that's just a cultural thing. I don't know. Maybe it's more common. Um, well, no, we're in the Bible Belt. We're in the South. <laughs> but I didn't grow up in the South. I don't know. It wasn't my childhood custom. But I know there's a lot of Christians that they, they're constantly doing this, you know, Brother Ed and Brother Doug and, and, you know, Brother Joe and whatever, and Sister this and that. And it's very common in a whole lot of places. And uh, I don't know if we can, we can revive that here or not, but, um, you know, if, if the Lord does, fine. If not, you know, I don't want to be phony about it. Um, but it's a common term. And, there's no, and, it's, and it's, by the way, it's inclusive. Brethren includes brothers and sisters both, okay? Hope we're fine with that. We don't have to be weird about it, but the uh, I understand the 2020 update to the New American Standard Bible is replacing every single one of these brethren with brothers and sisters. Okay, so I guess they they want extra ink on the page and probably more pages in their Bibles just to have um, to remove every brethren reference and replace them all with brothers and sisters references um, because I guess that's the that's the woke age in which we live. I don't know. Anyway. Specifically, though, these ones that we know by name, Quartus, Quartus the brother in Romans 16, 23. And, you know, um, a lot of these are sections that we tend to gloss over, um, kind of like the begats of the Old Testament. Uh, you get the salutations and the greetings in the New Testament. And, you know, Romans 15, Romans 16, long list of names and people's eyes just glaze over and they quit paying attention. But this is part of the God-breathed and inspired text where we read, Gaius, host to me to the whole church, greets you. Erastus, the city treasurer, greets you. And Quartus, the brother. And I don't know about you, but I don't see that statement of Quartus the brother to be insulting at all. It's placed in, in opposition in a tandem here with Erastus the city treasurer. You think that's a big deal? You know, in a place like Corinth, that was a wealthy city. And, and Erastus is the city treasurer. And Gaius, host to Paul and host to the entire church. How big was his house? Okay, we're going to talk about house churches uh, in, in this context. And um, the idea of, of having, of owning a home, living in a, in a residence large enough for a local church to meet in, and then uh, plus, uh, you know, provide lodging for whatever length of time that a traveling apostle happens to be passing through. 
uh, when, when Paul was in Corinth the first time, he was there for 18 months. Okay, You know, if somebody drops in, you got a spare room for him for the next 18 months and uh, things like that. But uh, apparently, Gaius did. And uh, we can appreciate that. But, the, but Quartus, Quartus the brother. And it's not clear. We don't know anything else about Quartus. You know, was he the fourth? Um, you know, I guess when parents get tired of, of uh, they, they don't know what to name their kids. And so the second son gets, you know, Segundus and the third son and the fourth son becomes Quartus. And they just kind of start numbering them after that, I guess. Anyway, Sosthenes, the brother, is mentioned in 1 Corinthians 1.1. 1, 1. And um, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Sosthenes, the brother. Sosthenes actually was a native of, of Corinth, and Sosthenes appears to have been a synagogue leader uh, until he gets saved and, and crosses into the church age. And uh, so he goes from a synagogue leader to a local church leader, um, and he travels with Paul, and he is listed as a co-author of the text of, of uh, 1 Corinthians. I find that interesting as well. Titus, of course... Maybe I shouldn't say, of course. Um, Titus is called a brother. I have no rest for my spirit, not finding Titus my brother. But taking my leave of them, I went on to Macedonia. And I think there's also an element, too, that I wonder when it comes to apostles, when it comes to uh, traveling itinerant ministers. I mean, you read the list of dangers, like dangers on the road, dangers in rivers, dangers in the oceans, and Dangers from robbers, dangers from countrymen, dangers from Gentiles. And, and you realize, you know, it was, a, it was a rough life having that kind of a ministry and traveling and doing what they were doing. And, and Paul wasn't just describing his experiences. I'm sure his experiences were common to Titus and Timothy and all these guys, these fellow workers that he names. So when he calls them brothers, to me, it's almost like band of brothers. It's almost like the camaraderie of, of, of warfare, you know, and, and the, the troops that you went to war with and, and you know, the, the soldiers I served with in Desert Storm, you know, 30 years later, man, they're my brothers. And, you know, I'd do anything for them. And that's, uh, to me, there's, there's that element of this language as well that I see in, uh, in the New Testament. This is the section here where Paul's describing the turmoil he was going through because he uh, had lost touch. And uh, in the ancient world, they didn't have text messaging or Twitter or anything. You know, he couldn't just send a text to Titus to say, uh, you know, you okay? And, uh, and uh, it had been weeks, months since he last saw Titus. And, and, you know, now Paul, I think Paul was, was beating himself up that Titus was dead. That, and it was his fault. He sent him into to Corinth and uh, things didn't go well. And he had no rest for his spirit. And taking my leave of them, I went to Mass. And I can't tell you. Notice, when I came to Troas for the gospel of Christ, a door was opened for me in the Lord. Well, praise Jesus. Hallelujah. A door was opened for him in the Lord. This is a work assignment. And what does the Apostle Paul do? He punts. It's a fumble on the snap. I mean, it's just a busted play. And... Um, even though a gospel a door was open for him in the Lord, he said, I had no rest for my spirit, not finding Titus my brother, but taking my leave of them, I went on to Macedonia. I mean, terrible. You talk about dropping the ball, you talk about um, you know, just leaving somebody in the lurch. <laughs> uh, of course, Christ knows what he's doing. I'm sure he had somebody else on hand there to, you know, Eutychus or somebody could have could have had ministry in Troas, but um yeah. No rest for my spirit, but not finding Titus, my brother, taking my leave of them, I went on to Macedonia. And he does encounter uh, Titus shortly after that. So that's the encouragement that comes there. There are also various companions of Titus that are mentioned in chapter 8, a couple of them. We don't even know who they are by name. 2 Corinthians 8.16, Thanks be to God who puts the same earnestness on your behalf in the heart of Titus. So God put a zeal in Titus' heart on behalf of the uh, Corinthian saints. He not only accepted our appeal, but himself being very earnest, he has gone to you of his own accord. You know, it's one thing if Paul dispatches somebody, you know, dispatches Tychicus or dispatches somebody to go carry a letter somewhere or go do something. And they're just doing it because they're serving the Lord and they're doing what Paul wants them to do. 
But in this case, man, Titus was on board. Uh, it was it was in his heart. It was it was a motivation there that that he was uh, fully engaged. So he was there ministering in his own priesthood and his own volitional capacity, bearing fruit for his own his own um, volition. And we have sent along with him the brother, whose fame in the gospel has spread through all the churches. And uh, as famous as he was in that day and age, um, he's not famous enough for us to know his name. Okay. A lot of theories, a lot of ideas. You know, is he talking about Luke here? Who is he talking about? Okay. And there's legends and traditions that Luke and Titus were Gentile brothers and whatnot. Um, and I guess, you know, you could be famous as a gospel writer if you write a gospel like the Gospel of Luke. But uh, in any event, there is an unknown brother that is a companion of Titus. And then in addition to that, another brother. Verse 22, we have sent with them our brother, whom we have often tested and found diligent in many things, but now even more diligent because of his great confidence in you. So there's Titus, there's the gospel famous brother, and now there's the tested and diligent brother. And these three men have been sent ahead of Paul in his travels. Um, Maybe that's Timothy. Um, we, We don't know. It's not stated by name. And then Titus gets these other titles as well. Besides brother, he's called partner, fellow worker, and um, apostles of the churches, apostoloi of the churches, a glory to Christ. Tychicus is called a brother in Colossians 4.7. As to all my affairs, Tychicus is called a beloved brother. So there's the adjective connected to brother the agapetos adelphos, the beloved brother and faithful servant and fellow bond servant in the Lord. Well, he's got three titles. That really gets wordy. I wonder, what did his business cards look like? Okay, Beloved brother, faithful servant, fellow bond servant in the Lord. Colossians and Ephesians both give that label to, uh, to Tychicus. Epaphroditus is called a brother in Philippians 2.25. I thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger and minister to my need, your apostolos and the uh, liturgos, minister to my need. The liturgy minister, that's interesting. Onesimus is called a brother in Colossians 4.9 and, and significantly in Philemon 16. Okay? Because when uh, Philemon receives Onesimus back, he's not just getting back a slave. You used to have a slave, you lost your slave, he came back. You have a slave back like you used to have, but more than a slave. A beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. In other words, physical temporal service and spiritual service. We'll We'll deal with that because uh, that's kind of the main point of this book. Colossians 4.9 also calls Onesimus, our faithful and beloved brother, who is one of your number, who is one of you. Now he's writing to the Colossians. We spent two years studying the book of Colossians, and um, you know we can name all the Colossians we know on one hand, and Onesimus is one of them by name, that he is a part of the congregation of Colossae. Even before he was saved, he was one of their number. How does that work? Because he got saved when he went to prison. Paul said, I begot my child in imprisonment, Onesimus. So that tells us he was an unbeliever when he left Philemon's household. Okay? Just chew on it. We've got some stuff coming up. I'm kind of excited to, to get to that. But the beloved and faithful brother, they will inform you of the whole situation here. It's a couple times now where we've seen brethren have the blessing to be able to tell stories. <laughs> you know, your brother can tell all kinds of stories about you because he remembers back in the day, right? And uh, but that's true in earthly terms. It's true in spiritual terms. Brothers go through things together. And so there's no better person to give a report than uh, than these dear brothers when Paul dispatches them to the different places. Philemon himself is called a brother in Philemon 7 and Philemon 20. He says, The uh, hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you, brother. 
very tender when Paul calls Philemon a brother there in verse 7. That's the conclusion to his, his uh, Thanksgiving section. And then verse 20. Yes, brother, let me benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. That Paul was going to benefit um, through Philemon's refreshment ministry. Philemon. Point three in the outline. We've had Paul. We've had Timothy. Now we're looking at Philemon. He is the beloved one and our fellow worker. To Philemon, our beloved agapetos. Our agapetos and fellow worker. The name Philemon means affectionate. We've talked about that a couple times already. Phileo is a verb of love. It's not agape love. It's a verb of uh, rapport love. It's a, it's a verb of, of uh, intimacy. And uh, along with the verb phileo is the noun philos, which means friend or lover. And then you've got uh, a philema is a kiss. If you greet one another with a holy kiss, then you have the philema vocabulary there. And so philemon, um, yeah, affection is fine, or kisser, whatever you want to whatever you want to uh, label this, and a common name. We talked about that in the introduction as well, how many Philemons are attested in Greek literature in, uh, amongst the, uh, the, the comics and poets and other um, writers of, in ancient Greek, several of them, several Philemons known to us in Greek literature. The only Philemon in the Bible, of course, is right here. And he is the beloved this means we get both sides of love here. We get the phileo love and we get the agape love. That Philemon himself is named for the, the phileo, but his title is beloved one uh, that's connected to the agape love. So you see how both loves are in play here. He is called beloved. Agapetos. Strong's number 27, used 60 times in the Greek New Testament, or 61 times. Now this is curious too, because it's all throughout the New Testament. It's a common term for a believer, just like brother is a common term for a believer. But and then it has specific uses when specific people are addressed as beloved. Again, we don't do a lot of that here. The only thing I think we do for weddings and funerals. For weddings or funerals, the pre preacher gets up there and he says, Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today in the, you know, in the sight of God and the presence of this company to unite this man and this woman together in the divine institution of marriage. Right? But unless it's a wedding or a funeral, I don't know that I've ever used the word beloved in, a talk, you know, in an address talking to, talking to folks. And, and maybe that's something else we've got to start doing more and more. So we're going to start calling each other brother and sister, and we're going to start referring to each other as beloved. Okay? Whether we want to or not, we should just get in the habit of it. <laughs> and it's useful. And it maybe the best thing in the world, um, by recognizing that we're all beloved because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And that this uh, brother that, that you're, you're on the verge of harboring mental attitude sin against, uh, you better stop right there because they're beloved. Christ died for that brother. All right, so um, you know it, it really helps us in maintaining our spiritual objectivity towards one another here in the body of Christ. But I think uh, most of all, the significance of this term is that this is the term that God the Father applied to His Son. That Jesus comes to the River Jordan to be baptized, and the Father says, "This is my agapetos." The voice out of heaven said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And we're familiar with the context here in Matthew chapter 3, right? Jesus comes to be baptized. John tried to prevent him, saying, I have need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? <laughs> you know, this shoe needs to be on the other foot. What's going on here? I'm the sinner. John, seeing this because John was preaching a baptism of repentance. And he knows that the one God-man standing in front of him has no need of any repentance. And so he's a bit flabbergasted that he would even show up and, and stand in line and, and submit to the, to the water ritual. But Jesus said, permitted at this time in this way, it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Yeah, Jesus had no repentance, had no need of repentance, but he identified with those who do. He identified with each one of us. And, and thank God that he did. So he permitted him. 
And after being baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were open, and he saw the Spirit of God descending as a dove and lighting on him. We got the full Trinity right here. We got the God man, God the Son, and the person of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Then we have the Holy Spirit descending upon him as a dove, and then we have the voice of God the Father coming out of heaven. A voice out of the heavens that said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. So Jesus Christ, this is the launch of his ministry. This, I, I believe too, this is the great oh no moment when uh, for, for 30 years or for 28 years at least, um, Satan has been puzzled. Satan has been left in the dark. Satan, you know, he motivated Herod. He massacred all those babies in Bethlehem. And then nothing. And Satan's scratching his satanic head, looking around and figuring, you know, wondering if he was successful or not. <laughs> and had no clues for all these years until this moment. And then the heavens are open. This is my beloved son. And Satan's like, oh, <laughs> oh no. And so what happens next? Take him out to the wilderness and start tempting him. Okay, right, right, right from that moment. So this is a term, beloved one. God the Father applies it to Jesus Christ. My beloved one in whom I am well pleased. He says it again in Matthew 12. Quotation from Isaiah. Yep, Jesus, aware of this, withdrew from there. Many followed Him and He healed them all. But He warned them not to tell who He was. There has been a, a bridge has been crossed. A tipping point has been reached. And Jesus is no longer preparing His disciples for the kingdom. Instead, He's preparing them for the cross. He warned them not to tell who he was. This was to fulfill what was spoken through Isaiah the prophet. Behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased. It's a prophecy from Isaiah. I will put my spirit upon him and he shall proclaim justice to the Gentiles. He will not quarrel nor cry out, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. Great prophecy there in Matthew 12. Also in Matthew 17.5. On the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, led them up on a high mountain by themselves. This is where he had promised them some of them were going to get a glimpse of the kingdom. He said, some of you will see the kingdom. And then he gives them a prophetic vision as he's transfigured before them. Led them up on a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. And his face shone like the sun. You know, for this brief moment, you know, for most of his earthly life and ministry, he, was, he had laid aside his privileges. He had emptied himself. He had, uh, under kenosis, he had come in great humility. But for this one episode, for this brief moment, they got a glimpse. They got a tiny little glimpse as he was transfigured. His face shone like the sun. His garments became white as light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here if you wish. I will make three tabernacles here, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. Peter, will you just shut up? <laughs> Come on. But like so many of us, he just starts talking and he's not thinking. He's just, you know, talk first, think later. That's, the, that's not good uh, methodology in the Christian walk. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud said this, is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to Him. That dumb idea you have of the threefold uh, tabernacle thing, forget it. <laughs> my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So when we view agapetos as a title, a term that the Father applies to Jesus Christ, how significant does that make it then that it becomes, uh, it transfers then to us? We are in Christ. How does the Father view us? He views us in Christ. How do we view one another? We should be viewing one another in Christ. From now on, we should be recognizing no one according to the flesh. We all are in Christ as beloved. A significant expression for members of the church. Acts 15.25 and 1 Timothy 6.2 This is where James calls Barnabas and Paul beloved. It seemed good to us, having become of one mind, to select men to send to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul. 
So you have those pillars in Jerusalem and, uh, and they're reckoning Paul and Barnabas to be not just brothers, but beloved. Our beloved Barnabas and Paul. Men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, you talk about heroes. 1 Timothy 6.2 Now here's an interesting context too. Let's, I'm glad we got to this. Because it's a slavery context, and it's going to connect, you know, pointedly, it's going to relate to Philemon. It's going to relate to Onesimus and what they might experience after the events of Philemon come to a close, right? I mean, after we finish the epistle and we're left hanging like, well, what happens next? Okay, what's the rest of the... Paul Harvey doesn't tell us the rest of the story. Um, we just have legends and traditions. But um, anyway, First Timothy 6, all who are under the yoke as slaves are to regard their own masters as worthy of all honor, so that the name of God and our doctrine will not be spoken against. As we saw in Colossians 4, as we're going to see again in Ephesians 6, that um, Christian slaves have a duty unto the Lord, first and foremost, which should motivate them in their duty to their earthly masters. And that's being expressed here. So that the name of God and our doctrine will not be spoken against. You don't want to be a slug and, and be a, a discredit to the, to the name of Jesus Christ and, uh, and the issues there. Those who have believers as their masters, oh my, now it gets worse. <laughs> because you back up again and you say, wait a minute. In verse 1, some of those slave masters are probably not even saved. So you're a Christian, you're a slave, and your master is, is, a, is a pagan going to hell. You're going to work as hard as you're going to work for him? Yes, you are. Because it's not about him. It's not about what he's earned or deserved. It's about Jesus Christ. You're serving as unto the Lord. You're going to be a testimony. And then, if he is a believer, that just doubles down even more. Those who have believers as their masters must not be disrespectful to them because they are brethren. So don't think you get to skate because he's a Christian and you're a Christian and, and you're, going to, you're going to skate, you're going to coast on by, you got, uh, you're going to have easier duty than your fellow slaves. No, you better be working doubly hard. In fact, double and redouble your efforts. Serve them all the more. Because those who partake of the benefit are believers and beloved. So be, be a, an asset. Don't be a liability. Be an asset. Work harder. Bless that brother. Bless that brother abundantly. You get to be a tool of blessing. You know, think about it. In the, in the Old Testament, you have descriptions of blessing God blessed Abraham. And how did he bless Abraham? With flocks and herds and male and female servants. But now in the New Testament, you get to be one of those male and female servants. <laughs> how about that? You could be a conduit of the Lord's blessing to these wealthy uh, slaveholders in the, uh, in the early church. Serve them all the more because those who partake of the benefit are believers and beloved teach and preach these principles. And this, uh, this goes to right to what we're dealing with here in Philemon. So he's going to receive Philemon back not only as a slave, but more than a slave. As a slave who is now a believer. A slave that's been trained by the Apostle Paul. A hard-working slave that will not only produce uh, earthly benefits, but will be praying for you while he's at it. How about that? In addition to Philemon, specific beloved ones referenced by Paul include Eponidas, Ampliatus, Stachys, Persis, Timothy, several times, Epaphras, Tychicus, Onesimus, and Luke. Luke is called the beloved physician in Colossians 4.14. Not just a doctor, an agapetos doctor. <laughs> All right? He is the beloved physician. Okay. I suspect there were probably some non-beloved physicians out there too. <laughs> doctors you love and doctors you would rather never see again, right? <laughs> yeah. All right, well, we don't have time to look at those, but we'll pick up on this, and then we're going to talk about Apphia. Apphia the sister. Is she uh, Philemon's wife? Probably. Um, 
Why is she mentioned? Of all the women who could have been mentioned in the church, why is she mentioned? Um, we have a clue as to why uh, Archippus is mentioned, but why is Apphia mentioned? Of all the women who could be mentioned, she can't be the only woman in the church, why is she mentioned? What is her connection to Philemon? And more importantly, what is her connection to Onesimus? Was she somehow involved in the event that caused Onesimus' departure? Was the theft, was the wrongdoing, was the injury to her more so than to Philemon? Because Philemon, apparently Philemon is not the only person that has to apply grace and forgiveness. Anyway, we're going to talk about this as well. Lord willing and rapture pending. If we hear a trumpet between now and Sunday, I'm not coming back. We're, <laughs> we'll have a much better teacher in glory if, uh, in fact, that's the case. So, Father, I thank you for tonight. I thank you for this study. I'm looking forward to learning more. I thank you that we're just guessing now uh, with some detective work and putting some descriptions together. Um, there's very little in the New Testament about uh, Philemon or Aphia except for what we're reading right here. And uh, But I pray that we pay attention to the details and we can appreciate what we're learning and then making our own applications, Father, because um, any day now, I mean, somebody from my past might show up and am I, uh, am I harboring something against them? And uh, how do I deal with it, Father? How do any of us deal with it in, uh, in a biblical way? So uh, open our eyes, open our hearts. We thank you, Father, and we praise you in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Alrighty, folks, we'll see you here, there, or in the air.